I was born April 24th. 1961. My mom and dad named me James Smith, was named after my dad. And for the first 18 years of my life, if you knew me, you called me James or Smitty. My mom called me Jimmy, dad too. I remember my high school years. Went to University City High School Philadelphia, PA, played football, played basketball, played baseball, National Honor Society, graduated number five in my class as James Smith. I then went to college, Widener University in Chester, PA. Demographically, my high school was 99% Black African-American. By college, stark contrast, contrast, I would say it was essentially 95% white. I remember when I stepped on that campus, I, I looked around and I didn't feel as smart, as confident as I once did. I remember right away my friends and colleagues and classmates and teammates on campus, they begin to call me Jim. It's when I became Jim Smith. Now, it wasn't something that I volunteered for, but I thought if this was my ticket into fitting in, I'll just be okay with Jim. Now, initially when I started using it, I felt like more Will, I mean more Carlton than I did Will. But I, I put my gym on like a pair of Spanx. And it felt tight, it felt different. But that's who I was prior to 1999. In 1999 is when I became Jim Smith Jr. And that's a picture of my dad. My, my dad played a huge role in me taking on that new identity. You see the pursuit going on here? My dad, the life of every party, charismatic, funny, friendly. My hero taught me sports. And actually he got me involved in entertainment. He, he's the reason why I'm a speaker today. Because when I was a little guy, he told me that I should join and become a part of the Jackson Six. Now, you might know them as the Jackson Five, but there was really six of us. There was Michael, Marlon, Tito, Jackie, Jermaine, and James. And we would do concerts in our two-bedroom, second-floor apartment in West Philly, when it was time to play the guitar like Tito and Jermaine, I would pick up a broom and start playing. And it was time to sing like Michael and Jackie, I would use a brush and sing into the brush. Our imaginary friends were there, my stuffed animals, my GI Joes, but I was in concert form. And who would know that 40 years later that I would be a professional speaker and educator? pursuing this construct called authenticity. The other side of my father though was, was a, a gory side. My, my father professionally worked as a butcher in a meat market. And he would tell my mom that it was so cold there, freezer cold that he started drinking. And he drank heavily, oftentimes stumbling and staggering home two blocks from 46 in Market to 46 in Sansa where we lived. Sometimes barely getting his key in the door, sometimes getting the key in the door and not being able to scale the 14 steps to the top. And when my dad wanted more to drink when he got home, he would look behind the chairs and the toilet where he put his other drinks. And if my mom found them, she would pour them down 
the toilet. And when she did that, those evenings were filled with abuse. But when I was 11, I remember my mom pulling me and my brother into the room and saying, Rodney, Jimmy, I saved $2,100. We have a choice. We can move and buy a new home or we can buy a car. But if we do move, your, your father's not coming with us. What? Wow, are you kidding me? 11 years old, my brother was seven. What a question. What a question. But we chose our future, which meant leaving. My parents were divorced when I was 11. I saw my father again two times in the next 20 some odd years. Once at his mother's funeral, once when my daughter was born. And I did my research and found him and took her to see him. I remember going into the house and he looked at me more than he looked at his granddaughter. I was 35 at the time. Four years went by and we decided on May 9th, Sunday, May 9th, Mother's Day, May 9th, that we were going to get together and have one of those long awaited talks between father and son. I couldn't wait. Finally, we were going to have that let's come down Front Street talk. In the morning of May 9th, I remember getting dressed for church and the phone rang. Hello? No, I don't want to sit down. What's up? It was my, my brother. He was calling. What's up? No, I don't want to sit down. What's up? He had called to tell me that our father had a heart attack that morning and it passed. So our long awaited conversation never happened. Seemingly we did not get closure. And at that moment I decided a way to keep my father with me all the time was to start using my junior because he was James Smith Sr. It changed again. The pursuit continued. And then last year, amidst all the noise around the George Floyd situation, because there was a pandemic, I remember sitting at home, watching TV, watching the news, watching the nonstop reporting and saying to myself, I wish educators, politicians, entertainers, athletes, religious leaders, I wish they would do something to help create more equity, equity and inclusion in this world. And then I had this epiphany. Why am I waiting for other people to do something? Why don't I do something? I'm an educator. I'm a speaker. I'm a coach. I'm a trainer. I speak for a living. I have the privilege of the platform. I could do more. I could be more of an advocate. And that's when I decided I am going to be more of an advocate. I am going to be speaking more to equity, inclusion, and empowerment, diversity. And I'm going to do it using my birth name. And that's when I went back to James. So now I call myself James Smith Jr., Dr. James Smith Jr. I have friends who still call me Jim, but that's okay. I'm still on this pursuit, authenticity. Now, those were the four stages of my pursuit. My focus began to get clearer after I left corporate America, started my own company, and started doing workshops on diversity, equity, leadership, presentation skills. Regardless of what session I did, I would hear refrains like this. Sure, they want you to be authentic as long as it falls in line with what they want. Or I heard, I can't truly be myself at work. Or I heard, I'm one way at work and I'm one way at home. And I'm thinking, what's going on here with people not being 
not believing that they can be authentic, be whole, be who they are at work. I said, I'm going to do my, my doctoral research on authenticity. Yeah. And I remember my, my classmates saying, authenticity? Come on. Do artificial intelligence. Do Bitcoin. Do cybersecurity. Do something that's going to make a co bigger contribution to our world. But for me, it was authenticity. And this former people pleaser did not change his course this time. And I remember the first research article that I read. I read this statistic. It said, in 2013, a Deloitte study found that more than half of employees in today's workforce cover up some part of their identity at work to try to fit in with underrepresented groups, LGBTQ individuals, Blacks, women of color, women, Hispanics, Indians feeling the most pressure to cover aspects of who they are. And I remember when I read that article, it took me back to one of my corporate stops. It was my first real corporate job. I remember, I remember because I had a cubicle. <laughs> I had an electric typewriter with an automatic correction. Yes, I had arrived. I was five years into my job. I was working in human resources training and development when my boss was promoted to director of total quality management and customer service. Shortly into her new role, she reached back, said, Jim, I want you to come up and work with me. Special project. That's right, you're coming to the executive floor. And that executive floor, are you kidding me? Oh, man. When I got on the floor, I wanted to take my shoes off. I didn't want to get the carpet dirty. White carpet, windows everywhere. And in the executive wing, every office had its own bathroom. Now, I still had a cubicle out front, but I was on the executive floor. And actually, the only person of color on the executive floor. And every day, I was in my pioneer mindset. I'm going places. I'm going places. One afternoon. One afternoon, I was getting prepared for a banquet that evening. The banquet was for minority interchange. That was an affinity group within the organization for underrepresented groups who were on a management path. And it was our banquet. And I was gonna ride two hours with my boss and my boss's boss to the banquet. I was excited. Me in the car with two senior leaders. Are you kidding me? You don't get that type of access typically. Well, it was almost 5.30. It's a two-hour ride. I got up out of my chair and I headed to my boss's office to say, we have to go. It's time. And I think my boss's boss had the same thing in mind because I heard him approach her office and he said, will you hurry up? It's time for us to go. We have a long way to go. And as I was walking toward her office, I heard her response. Give me a second. Give me a second. It's going to be a lot of Black people there. I have to put on my Black face. I froze in my tracks. went back to my office until it was time to go. The ride up, they spoke. I didn't say a word. During dinner, they spoke. I didn't say a word. On the way back home, they spoke and I didn't say a word. When I got home, I was thinking, why didn't I say something? Why didn't I let them know how I felt? That was unfathomable, that was egregious. How could you 
I report into you. You're my boss. And you said something that was so disrespectful. But looking at this quote, I, I research, I'm reminded why I didn't say anything. I wanted to fit in. I didn't speak truth to power. I wasn't being authentic. I was going along to get along. And that's what happened. <sighs> Today, especially for the rest of this presentation, my focus is going to be on three ways to be more authentic. Three tools to use. Personal power, personal accountability, and of course, faith. Faith will move mountains. But before I move into those three, let me give you a little bit of research on authenticity. Authenticity defined involves both owning one's personal experiences and acting in accordance with those experiences. And those experiences include our thoughts, our emotions, our needs, our wants. It's a commitment to one's identity and values. It's important for how we operate, how we act, how we behave, our self-regulation. And when this commitment is violated, we feel less authentic. And as I was doing my research, I began to wonder, is authenticity either or, or is it more or less? You're either authentic or inauthentic, or there are degrees of authenticity. And through my research, I began to believe that authenticity is around more or less, where we can turn our authenticity up or down giving the circumstances, but we decide what to do. And it's a course of action that we choose as the best course, not out of fear, but out of wisdom. And the detractors or the folks who don't believe in authenticity, those scholars and researchers, they say that people cannot be authentic all the time because we are constantly becoming Every day, we're becoming we're like a kaleidoscope. We're changing every day. They say that a painting is authentic. A piece of jewelry is authentic. It's one of a kind. But as individuals, we're constantly shifting. We're constantly changing. The pursuit of authenticity continues for many of us. Let's go a little bit deeper with some research. Four dimensions. Four dimensions of authenticity. And they are... Awareness of self-understanding, unbiased processing or openness. Hang in there with me. Our behaviors or our actions and our relational orientation. Let's go a little bit deeper. With regard to awareness or self-understanding, we're talking about possessing and being motivated to increase knowledge of and trust in our motives, our feelings, our desires, our self relevant cognitions. It's about understanding who we are. How often do you think about who you are? Is it every day? Is it every February? How often? It's about our unbiased processing or openness. This is going deep into our existence, who we are. It's objectively recognizing our ontological re realities evaluating our desirable and undesirable self aspects. Who are we? What are we made of? When we get into behaviors and actions, it's talking about how we show up, acting in accord with our values, our preferences, our needs, opposed to faking it till you make it, or going along to get along, or falsely merely to please other people, again, former president of the Philadelphia chapter of the People Pleasing Society of America, or to attain rewards or to avoid punishments, self-perceived punishments. 
that's why in corporate, I chose not to speak truth to power because I believe if I did, an exit interview would be in the offing. Or our relational orientation. And essentially that's striving toward creating productive interpersonal relationships. Let me ask you, based on what I've shared thus far, where are you? What are you thinking? What are you considering doing differently? And when? For me, it's been a 60 year pursuit. And I think I'm just about there. But as I said earlier, we're always becoming. So I mentioned three ingredients, three ingredients that would help us live a more authentic life. The first ingredient is personal power. Here's a definition of personal power. It says, personal power is the kind of mental toughness that we bring to every situation. It's the ability to take decisive and deliberate action toward a desired goal or down an optimal path that helps us accomplish that particular goal. It's about living our life intentionally with a sense of purpose and a sense of optimism. Now, that's what it is. Let's take a look at what gets in the way. And these are our self-created barriers. Now I have 20 and I'm gonna go through them rather quickly, but as I'm going through them, if that barrier is true for you, that's right, if you own that barrier or barriers, I want you to jot it down because these are self created barriers to personal power that help limit our level of authenticity. Here's the first one, lack of self-confidence. If that's true for you, write it down. Fear of taking risk. If that's true for you, write it down. Low expectations of others so you find yourself doing everything because you don't trust that others are gonna be able to do it as well as you can do it. So you do the heavy lifting and probably end up blaming them. Low self-worth, where you say, I'm just a this, I'm just at that, I'm new at this, where you don't step into your bigness. Next one. Is this true for you? Come on, fess up, fess up. Have to be perfect. Have to be perfect. And let me ask you, is that working for you? <laughs> is it working for you? Fear of failure. To that, I would say we even forecast failure. That's why we don't do it. I teach a lot of classes and I give people an opportunity to present or share their ideals. And invariably, someone will do a great job. And the next person will say, oh, I'm not going next. I'm not following them. I'm not asking you to supersede what they did. I'm just asking you to go next. And you're giving meaning to what next means based on what that person did or how well they did it. The next one, lack of enthusiasm. Lack of enthusiasm. I mean, there's some pretty zombie-like people out there. If Michael Jackson was still alive and he did the thriller part too, I know of several people who could be those dummies, <laughs> those zombies. They say in life that some people light up a room when they walk in and some people light up a room when they walk out. People who lack enthusiasm light up that room when they walk out. Next one, fear of rejection. Next one, wanting to be liked again. I tore up my people-pleasing membership card. I want to be respected. I want to be valued. I want to be understood. I have lost sight, lost sight of wanting to be liked. Next one, makes excuses and blame others. If any of these are true for you, come on, be authentic, come clean, write it down. 
The next 10, critical. Yes, next one. Fear of embarrassment. Again, we're giving meaning to embarrassment. Next one. Indecisiveness. Next one. Close-minded. Let's keep going. We focus on problems, not possibilities. We're controlling. Lack of trust. We let what happened in the past guide what happens today. We're self-critical. And finally, we right fight. And that's fighting to be right. Getting the last word, last phrase, last sentence, last text, last tweet. But do we win? No. We create more distance versus closeness. And usually this happens when someone is pouring into us, giving us advice, sharing wisdom, and we fight to stay the same. Let's keep going. This is a quick model relative to how we see things from time to time. See, something happens to us. Something happens, and then we tell a story about why it happened. And guess what? That story is typically negative. So then we find ourselves not being as authentic as we can because we're living a life of stories. Something as small as you walk into a room where people are talking and you enter the, enter the room and they stop talking. What does one typically say? They were talking about me. How do you know? But that's the story you create as a result of what's happening. I did that during this pursuit to authenticity. I made up a lot of, if I say this, this is what's going to happen. I did this and this is why it happened. Limiting my personal power, limiting my level of authenticity. It's around how we see things. Aeneas Nen, love this quote, says, we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. In this brief video that I'm about to show you, to me, reinforces this phenomenon. Take a look, jot down your key thoughts, but it's about our mind and what it does for us. Let's take a look. You are about to hear a strange but true story. Legend has it, Harry Houdini, the master magician, once claimed that he could break out of any jail cell in the world. All he had to do was walk into that jail cell with his street clothes on. I'll be out of there in one hour, no problem, he said. Well, a very old jail down south heard about Houdini's claims and they accepted his challenge. On the day of the event, many people gathered outside. Very confidently, Houdini walked right into the jail and into the cell and they shut the metal doors behind him. The first thing Houdini did was he took off his coat. Then, very strangely, he took off his belt. Secretly hidden in Houdini's belt was a 10-inch piece of steel, very tough and very flexible, and Houdini started working. In about 30 minutes, that confident expression Houdini had when he walked in disappeared. In one hour, he was bathed in sweat. And at the end of two hours, Houdini in defeat collapsed against the door, which then opened. It opened because you see, 
that door had never been locked. But that's not entirely true, is it? That door was locked. It was firmly and thoroughly locked in Houdini's mind, which meant it was locked as if the best locksmith in the world had put his lock on it. The mind is powerful. How many doors in your life do you think are locked but aren't? How many times have you been stuck in the mental prison of overthinking? Something that really had a simple solution. There is an ancient African proverb that says, when there is no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. Your mind is the most powerful force you will ever face. It will tell you lies. It will tell you, you can't do that. You're not meant for that. You're not good enough for that. You can't go on anymore. You don't have the energy. You must thank it for its opinion and carry on. Because like Houdini showed us, the only locked doors that exist are in your own mind. The doors in reality are open. And all you have to do is walk through. Let me ask you, thoughts about the video, reactions? How does it apply to you? What mental prison do you find yourself sometimes in that limits you from being the authentic person you know you could be, professionally and or personally? Those quotes I showed you earlier that led to me wanting to do my doctoral research on authenticity, where people say I'm one way at home, one way at work, or I can't be myself at work, or they really don't want you to be, people have given up. Their personal power is not as big and purposeful and as resourceful as it can be. Personal power is a key ingredient to us living, consistently living a more authentic life. And like I keep saying, I know how to live a less authentic life but I also know how to pursue it. And as I said in the very beginning, I've been pursuing this and not really knowing what I was pursuing, but I got it now, I have it now. So personal power is the first key ingredient. The second key ingredient is personal responsibility. One of my mentors, Mike Jones, phenomenal consultant, teacher, educator, consultant, he wrote this quote in one of his books. And I think the quote is so profound, I'll read it to you. Life is not what you've been taught, is what you believe. It's not what you've experienced. It's the choices you made as a result. It's not about what happened to you, it's about how you've remembered it. It's not what challenges have come your way, it's what you've seen as challenging. It's not what has appeared on your path, it's what you've accepted. When we accept personal responsibility for our lives, everything is possible. Being more authentic is possible. Mike talks about the choices we make. One of my favorite quotes is that when we're young, we look a lot like our parents, but when we get older, we look a lot like our choices. What choices are we making that is limiting? Limiting our level of authenticity. What are the choices? Give it some thought. What choices have you made or have to make? And in understanding your choices and understanding your level of responsibility and accountability, you have to understand your why. Why am I doing this? Let me ask you, why do you do what you do? 
every day? Why do you associate with the people you associate? Why, why have you taken on this vocation? Your why. Do you understand your why? Let me drive home this point with another video. It's brief. But let's see the power of understanding our why. How do I know? A lot of people, when they think of the phrase, how do I know, they always want to put the what behind it. How do I know what I'm supposed to do? The, the question that you really should ask is, how do I know why I'm here? Because when you know your why, your what becomes more clear and more impactful. If you know, like for instance, um, people know that I do comedy, but that's what I do. My why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. So I can do comedy, I can write books, I can be in a movie because all of it is motivated by my why. In fact, I have a new, uh, a new web series out called Michael Jr. Break Time. Uh, we probably just did the sixth episode. It's on YouTube. So every single Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode on YouTube of Michael Jr. Break Time. What it is is it's me. I travel around the country, and I do stand-up comedy, in case you didn't know. And in the middle of my comedy set sometime, I'll stop and just talk to my audience. And we've been filming this, and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. So we're in Winston-Salem. I'm going to show you a clip from Winston-Salem. And I'm just talking to this guy in the audience, and he tells me that he's a, uh, a musical instructor at a school. So I was like, all right, you're a musical instructor. You know, can you sing? Let me hear you sing a song. So this is what happened at the last episode of Michael Jr.'s Break Time. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right. So um, let me get a couple. Let me get a couple bars of like uh, "Amazing Grace." Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That bro could sing, you know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, now, once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing. Here's what I want you to catch. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what becomes more impactful because you're walking towards or in your purpose. When you know your why, your what becomes more in focus, more intentional. What are your thoughts about the video? What are your thoughts? Where did it hit you once he discovered his why? Why do what you do? Why be more authentic? Powerful, powerful. It's the second ingredient. Second ingredient, personal power, personal responsibility with a caveat of understanding your why. I know why I do what I do. 
when I was in corporate, I worked with a lot of people who didn't like their jobs or didn't like what they were doing. And I said, if I ever own my own company, I'm going to position myself to go to organizations and help people get out of their own way, help people understand their why, help people go on joy searches and not job searches. Now part of it is helping people to become more authentic. Now the final tool, the final tool is faith. Wow, I wish I would have leaned into my faith more often during this journey. I really do. Because I believe if I had leaned into my faith more often during my journey, these situations would have happened. Number one, I would have spoken truth to power more often. Now, this comes with, with risk. It does come with risk. And it's not easy. But if I had leaned into my faith, I would not have worried about how the person was going to respond or what could happen as a result. And also people who speak truth to power, sometimes, sometimes they take a hit. They get wounded. But people who speak truth to power learn how to walk with the wound and they do so in faith not fear because they know faith and fear don't occupy the same room number two i would have lived what i gave more often some people say practice what you preach i say live what you give and do so in faith. That's the special ingredient, special power that can help you move into a greater level of authenticity. The next one. If I had leaned more into my faith when I was in those situations of uncertainty, bordering on being more inauthentic, I would have said more of thee and less of me, more of thee and less of me. Mm. We have it. We have it. But James, why do you lean into it more? You're doing all this heavy lifting on your own, psychological safety, thinking about it way too often. Faith was always there. And finally, knowing and living the truth. Because you know and I know the truth will set you free. Faith, the third and most powerful ingredient toward being more authentic. Let me share these last eight thoughts with you. They're marks of authentic faith. And I'll read each one of them to you. Number one, display the beatitudes, the blessings that Jesus described in his Sermon on the Mount. Number two, we should think with a transformed mind. We express genuine love and we respect authority. Number three, we should overflow with love actions. Number four, we should display the spirit's fruit. Number five, we should imitate Christ's humility and look out for others' interests. Number six, we should pray without ceasing. In everything, we give thanks. Number seven, we should carry out works of faith and compassion. We control our tongues and we speak wisdom. Number eight, we should hold to the truth 
about Jesus and defend it. Those are the eight marks of authenticity. And take a look. I put them all on, on one slide. As others study our lives for evidence that we are followers of Christ, how many of these marks do they see in us as we move toward that place called authenticity and move to it much more often than we're doing today? It's a wonderful place. You feel lighter. You feel more in control. Let me ask you, what's next for you? What's next for you? Who are you going to talk to? What are you going to read? What are you going to start practicing? Again, it's an amazing, compelling pursuit. And you know something? It's taught me a great deal. It's taught me the power of reinvention, the power of resiliency, the power of relying on faith and being, being okay with change. Being okay with change. My son Ian was born mm -hmm. when I was 44 years old. I so wanted a little boy. I wanted him to be my mini me. I wanted him to be a speaker, an educator, an athlete, class president, all by the age of five. <laughs> Lofty expectations. And when Ian came into this world, he did what most babies do. He cried, he laughed, he ate, he pooped, he began to sit up, he began to crawl, he began to stand up, he began to walk, he began to talk. My little man, Ian James Smith, I James Smith was well on his way. At around the 15, 16 month mark, Ian slowed down considerably. That jovial, charismatic personality had tuned down. He actually stopped talking. My wife and I, wow, we were concerned. Wasn't sure what was happening here. We took him to Children's Hospital. They took a lot of tests. It turned out that Ian was diagnosed as being autistic. He was on the spectrum. He was now nonverbal. Man, are you kidding me? No, 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 no. I didn't wait all these years for this. I, 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 I didn't wait all these years for this. God, really? I'm a speaker with a son who doesn't speak? I went to Victorville. What was me? Focus, focusing on what he couldn't do rather than what he could do. Looking at my neighbors outside playing with their children, tossing the ball back and forth, running on bicycles and looking at my little guy just wanting to do puzzles and do computers. And my little guy is 15 years old now. He's still on the spectrum. He's still nonverbal. I understand him. My wife understand him. He hasn't changed. I have. He's my hero. My situation changed when I chose to change how I saw my situation. My situation being inauthentic, people-pleasing, changed when I decided to step into my truth. The same could be for you. 
it's not too late. The quote is, you always get what you've always gotten until you become the person you've never been. This pursuit to authenticity has been rewarding for me. And it can be rewarding for you too. You've just been gym packed. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, is there anyone who has a question or comment? They can put it in the chat box and you can ask that of Dr. Smith and go from there. That was a lot to lot to take in, huh? <laughs> Here's there's another coming in, <laughs> coming in fast and furious now. How does one balance authenticity with a prideful self? It for me, what does that pride represent? How does it show up? Does it teeter on ego? Does it teeter on being right? Does it teeter on being the best representation of who you are? Staying true to yourself is one thing. Doing things with pride is something else. But if you can be prideful while still being authentic, I think that's a winning outcome. And sometimes having to turn down the volume for the betterment of the relationship shows a lot of humility and pride and a different level of pride as well. Common fabulous talk, thank you. And then that was great. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, thank you. It's, it's, it's late in the afternoon. Thank you for being with us the entire time. Well, on behalf of CFGP, I, I do thank Dr. Smith for you know, a, a very honest and frank and, and share a very personal sharing of of his story to be an authentic person. Um, let me see, oh, okay. I want also to acknowledge that Shelby Kranz, uh, the business operation manager for at Dr. Smith Jr. for assistance today, uh, today's event. She's been very helpful throughout this whole process. And also as Dr. Smith said, thank you to our audience for your participation in today's presentation. Without an audience, he's only speaking to himself. <laughs> <laughs> Some people say I do that all the time. <laughs> well, <laughs> as a as a fellow preacher on occasion, I, I hope at least some people listen. <laughs> <laughs> all this right, an amazing experience. I I so thank you for the opportunity to be with your group. Um, thank you. Thank you. It, it was memorable. I look forward to staying in, in touch. And hopefully the folks on today will reach out and um, stay in contact. And we can continue this journey, this authentic, authenticity journey together. Right. This presentation will be available on our website as, as well as the past pres presentations that we've had, the two other speakers uh, prior to this one, um, on, our, on the CFGP website. So have a wonderful evening, and we hope to see you at future Catholic Leadership Speaker Series. Again, thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Take care, everyone. God bless. Yeah.